Hi there, and welcome to Art for All, the Sketchbook School podcast. I am Danny Gregory, the founder of Sketchbook School, and I uh, welcome my friend Jill Bodonsky to join me today in our discussions about the creative brain and all of its strange magic. It is strange. Good to be here, Danny. (laughs) It's nice to have you here as well. So, um... How has your how has your week been? Have you been creative this week? Have you been doing stuff, making stuff? I went up to San Francisco mm. over the weekend for National Poetry Month and hung out at City Lights, where I just had this urge to write poetry. So yeah, it was it was pretty creative. How about you? Um, I didn't do anything nearly as interesting. I was I've been to City Lights, but I have not. It didn't. I haven't. I don't think I've ever ever written much poetry in my life. So. Besides the occasional limerick, so that's uh, something different for you. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I have to try that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I've been working actually on um, recording an audio book. So, a version of one of my books I'm doing is an audio book. So I've been doing that. Oh, great idea! Great it's idea. It's a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Is it? Yeah. Reading a whole damn book. I would much rather hear a audio book read by the author than somebody else because i don't think they get the inflections right so that's often glad you're doing it yeah that's often the case (laughs) as long as you have a a good a good voice um so yeah um and that's been the main thing so today we're going to talk about uh, our subject for today is um kind of comparison so how do you compare or how do you are you constantly comparing your work to other people so we're going to get into that in a second um, and then we're going to, we're going to do, um, a calisthenic next, which is, uh, a little, little challenge. And, um, then we're going to dive into our topic and then later on, we're going to read from some books that, or essays or magazines or, I don't know, graffiti, whatever it is that we've created <laughs> <laughs> about uh, that seems relevant. So. So shall we get on with it? If you um, let's begin with a with a cal- calisthenic. So good. So, Jill, you are the the, the master of the calisthenic. Tell us tell us what uh, this week's creative calisthenic is. Okay, so I put this on Facebook, so I've gotten a bunch of replies to it, but you have not heard it yet. And this is. Boom. You, <laughs> this is the first line in your best-selling memoir about your life as a pencil. Uh-huh. My life as a pencil. Stretch the imagination a little bit. Okay, so I would say chapter one. I'll be honest with you, I've made many mistakes, but fortunately, <laughs> I have an eraser. <laughs> Good one, right on the spot. So yeah, so if you have a creative calisthenic, if you have one that you've come up with, you, dear listener, um, share it with us. Particularly if you're on the YouTube comments thing, we would love to hear how you solve that. Your, mm-hmm. your thing. So what, what are some of the ones that folks came up with on Facebook? Okay, some good ones here. Adam Greenfield came up with, this is the story of how number two became number one. <laughs> <laughs> James Egret said, someone chewed off my butt. Um, let's see. Marcy Colleen said, this is where I draw the line and I dare you to cross it. Rich Trotto said, once the searing pain ended, I found myself very sharp and I became powerful. Julie Ostro said, let's get to the point. Let's see. Oh, here's a good one. Susan Gregory Gregory said, to be or not to be? To be being to be the pencil to be. To be. That's very good. Susan, kind of Gregory is that name of, Susan Gregory is the name of my late stepmother. I don't think that's the same one. No, I don't think she was around to do that. So, yeah. Here's the last one. Michelle Frederick Van Strom. I am a yellow golf pencil living in a blue pencil world. So a blue pencil world. Yeah. Oh, wait, Nikki Pittman said always number two, never number one. (laughs) There's a lot of good ones on here. Uh, 
Very good. Well, great. Well, let's get the lid out and move on to our topic of the <laughs> week, which is our, our block of the week. So our subject, well, why don't you describe our subject in your own words? I will. It's, it's one of the first things I talk about in workshops and retreats and my coaching training because it's toxic and it's out there more than it's ever been out there before because we can see so much of what other people do and it derails people. It just completely, and it's, it's an irrational but normal thing to look at other people and go, oh, I'm not good enough. It's the old, I'm not good enough because look what they're doing kind of thing. So comparison on Instagram, wherever you can see somebody else's art, your friends, what, and writing as well, whatever is creative. It's, it's just, it's part of who we are to, to compare ourselves. So you're not alone if you do it. What, what is your take on it, Danny? Well, I think, I think it's, I agree with you. There's a lot of people who are out there doing stuff that we want to compare ourselves to because, well, for a variety of reasons. One, we feel sort of insecure. So we don't know, like, is what I'm doing any good? And I look at somebody else, what they're doing, and I think, how, how, how come they're so much better at it than I am? Now, the question is, there may be a lot of reasons that are not obvious as to why they're better. They may have been doing it longer. They may have, uh, you know, made all kinds of sacrifices you haven't made to do that. There, there could be a lot of reasons that you don't see, so you're just looking at the end result. So that's that's certainly one thing, um, you know. But it, it also, so in, in in other words, I think it's a natural thing to do, but it's a very dangerous thing to do as well because we're, we're it's, it's a powerful weapon that we don't really know how to use effectively. So, yeah. Have you ever been derailed by comparing yourself to somebody? Sure, all the time. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there are people who, I, and it's it's kind of as I said, it's a double edged sword because the, at times it's it's great to look at. I mean, real art is steel, right? You look at what other people are doing, and you take from them, you know, and uh, stand on the shoulders of giants. All those various th sort of cliches, but so I think it is a normal and advised thing to do to look at what other people are doing. The question is, is it threatening? Is it, uh, mm. and that's that's where it becomes dangerous or dispiriting or you know it kind of gets you off the path. Yeah, I I do it all the time too. One story that stands out in my my memory is I was working in a bookstore when I was writing my first book, and my first book is the Nine Modern Day Muses and a Bodyguard, and I don't know if she did it on purpose, but the owner of the store held up the book of a best-selling author, and it was about muses um, and about kind of modern day muses. And she said, look, Jill, somebody's already written your book. And yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was blocked for months. And, you know, I, I didn't look at her book, but when immediately, but when I did, I realized it, it's nothing like the book I'm writing. It doesn't have humor in it. It's not playful. It was a good book, but it, it wasn't my book so i got back on the the path to writing my book but i think we can yeah, i mean I, but i i mean i i do think if you're if you're writing a book it does make sense to have a sense of what other people have done in that in your category i mean you don't want to you don't want to repeat what other people have said um and you do want to make sure that you have something valuable to contribute but you don't want to be writing necessarily in response to somebody else you know like I remember one of my first books was Creative License, and it is the, um, I wrote it in, res not in response, but I wrote it not long after reading The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, which is a classic, great book. It's not the Creative, the Creative License is not The Artist's Way, it's not the same thing, but actually when I made it, I asked them to make it exactly the same dimensions as The That's Artist's smart. Way. So that was very smart. Yeah, yeah. So in fact, if you have them both on your shelf, you'll see that they're the exact same size, and that was in part um, because I thought that was a great, it was a great book and a great and a, and a resource a lot of people have. But I wanted to do something that was very different, and I did do th a lot of things that were really different in it. But it was nice having, kind of having something to respond to, 
you know, even mm-hmm. if it took me in a completely different way. It's almost like that was the, the grain of sand that I dropped into my oyster. And then, you know, but the pearl I made was my own. So it was certainly um, a valuable thing. And I wouldn't say I was, um, I wasn't, I wasn't reduced by doing it. I wasn't, I didn't feel like, oh, I've just done a, a pale impression, impersonation of Julia Cameron. Although I, mm-hmm. I don't claim to be her. Yeah, yeah. I, the, the other thing, you know, when I was sending the book out, one of the agents that was looking at it said, there, there's enough fine books written on creativity. Um, and he, he rejected mine. And at the time, there was like 50,000 books on feng shui. <laughs> and it, even when my, my book got published, it was the first book people had read on creativity. So just the mindsets that, that put us into fear and comparison out there are ones we need to protect ourselves against to get the, you know, I have the bodyguard in my first book and we need the bodyguard for comparison and, and kind of allowing in what's going to help us and keeping out that, I don't know, I get slimed when I start, I, I just get a full body feeling of, oh, <laughs> I just posted this childlike drawing on Instagram and then I scrolled and there was like Michelangelo and, and Leonardo da Vinci and Picasso. So so what should we say I, to people? Should we say, don't look at what other people do? No, I, th- I think I think you're right. We need to. It's it's part of you know, last week we were talking about our <clears throat> developing our style and seeing what other people are doing. Go, ooh, I like that. But I, I do think we need blinders. I think we need a filter. You know, the first the first thing I tell people the first day of workshops is you're going to compare yourself. And as, as soon as you normalize it, you can go, oh, there I am. I'm comparing myself. I, everybody does this and I'm doing it too. Um, for me, that neutralizes it. it. It takes away that insidious, toxic feeling and just goes, I'm part of this bigger group of people. Um, but but you know, one thing Julia Cameron does say in her book is if you're feeling that feeling of envy, it's a signpost. It's it's a, a cue for you to take a step in the direction that you're looking at there. But make sure it's realistic. Break it down really, really small because you're not going to be that person. You're not going to produce what they're producing today. And to go ask yourself, what is it I like about this that is making me feel bad? And use it rather than allow it to to make you feel less than, I think. That's I think also is. draw a comparison that is a relevant comparison would be another thing I would say. Like, so for instance, if you are comparing your work on Instagram to a professional illustrator and you go and you look at them and you go, oh, they're so good. Well, if you understand a bit about what an illustrator does, you know, you realize that they are probably working with a different, completely different ambition than you have. So your ambition might be, I want to learn how to draw better. And so therefore I'm doing certain things. But as an illustrator, your goal might be, you know what, I want to attract potential clients. I want to find people who are going to hire me to do illustration. So, you know, that that's a very different goal. And, um, so you, you're comparing apples to oranges in a way there. It, it, as, a, as a person who's learning, you need to constantly go to places where you're not comfortable and you have to try things that you're not good at in order to stretch and to grow your muscles. As an illustrator, that's not what you want to do. You want to get good at one thing and get really good at it to the point where people will hire you as opposed to hiring your competitors other illustrators are your competitors in a way you may not see them you know you may not feel that way about them but that's ultimately if you're an art director going out to hire an illustrator you're going to just pick one among the ones that are available so each one is and so what they're trying to do is they're trying to say i have a very specific thing that i'm good at 
if you need this particular thing, I'm the best person to hire for that. That's a, v a totally different scenario than I want to learn to draw or I want to make cool stuff. So, or I want to yeah. have a good time, you know. Or, exactly. I want. I just want to do this to to avoid reality, to create my own world, to to be curious about what's going to happen. Yeah, really good point. I, I never thought of it that way, but illustrators need to be real consistent. And if you're just doing it for a good time, you can just really go off and do all sorts of things and allow give yourself permission to do that. And illustrators also, that's their whole job. That's mm -hmm. their whole job. They get up every day, that's what they work on. So, and then they put their best stuff online because again, these are products that they're selling. They're selling, it may be, it may be literally like here's, uh, you know, a, a dishcloth that has my drawings of dirty dishes on it, or it might be, um, I'm putting this out there because I want somebody to hire me to do this, or I might want to license this particular image that I'm making. It's a, just a different world, and it doesn't mean that you can't learn from what they're doing, and you can't, you know, take uh, inspiration from what they're doing, but understand that it's a different thing. And I think it's it's like comparing yourself with a professional golfer, let's say. You know, you just wouldn't look at a professional golfer and say, I'm no good, I can't do what they do. Well, obviously you can't. And it's not because they're better people or even necessarily more talented. They spend an awful lot of time doing this. They have a lot of resources around them. It's a, it's just a not a fair comparison and you, should, you don't need to bother with it, you know. I, and I, I think it goes back to delusional thinking as well, thinking that I can just sit down and draw like this person versus I need to practice a lot. But the thing that's different is is how vulnerable it can feel to start drawing and then be irrational, thinking you need to draw something really good right off the bat, not liking it, but other people can see it. and. And it goes back to our own feeling of competency, especially later in life when we've been competent at something. And we've done it for a long period of time. And a lot of people want to start something new and they're not competent at it. And they're comparing themselves to people who are competent. So to be able to be realistic about knowing, I mean, your animation was that little animated thing that you did was so right on target in terms of you couldn't draw right at the bat, but day after day you kept drawing and then your world broke open to this wonderful place of, of liking what you're drawing, enjoying it more. Yeah. Yeah. And I think another pretty basic thing is art isn't a competitive activity. I've always right. thought it was weird when they give out prizes for art. You know, it should. I feel terrible, exactly right? the same way. There shouldn't be because why do you need to feel better than other people with your art when each of our voice is different? Um, there's, yeah, there's room for everybody to hang on the hang on the wall. There's not. It's not. It's not. It doesn't. There's no reason to have hierarchy. And also, the 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 ways in which you would measure are so arbitrary and varied. I, th there have been occasionally there have been reality TV shows. There are you know competitions that have art. So there's like there's one in England, the best portrait painter in England. There's another one called like best landscape painter. Um, there was a TV show here in the United States that was also similar, where they would do the sort of eliminating an artist every week. And I always thought, what are you talking about? This is insanity. It makes no yeah. sense. And, you know, you have three judges and they decide, okay, this person is the best. And you think, well, bring me three other Were judges. They? They'll think something else. It's exactly it's, it, art is not, doesn't work that way. Art speaks yeah. to you. It may not, the fact that it doesn't speak to you doesn't necessarily mean that it's the art. It could mean that it's, that you're not paying attention, you're not listening, or it's not for you. So there's, there's just no sense that that's true. And I think another thing is, and I, this is probably the thing I say most often, you might be a good artist, but you're not a, necessarily a good critic. 
And yes. I think that a lot of times we're just not that good at comparing because we can't judge our own work objectively. And we may be looking at the other person's work and, and maybe we're reasonably good judges of that because we can say, well, that speaks to me, that appeals to me. And I look at my own work and it doesn't appeal to me. Again, it's fraught because there are so many other things that have gone into your judgment about your own work, your own feelings about yourself, all these other things that you are imposing on it. So it's just, it's too complicated and too unreliable to be something that you should put an awful lot of emphasis on. And it, it requires faith. It requires faith. Um, and I, I really go back to just being able to experiment at first because I, I don't know about you, but I look at my first sketchbooks and I, I thought some of that stuff was good. <laughs> and then over time, I'm like, wow, that's not as good as it is now for sure. But, but the other thing was true. I was comparing myself to, okay, this is the standard for good. And my stuff is this real childlike stuff. And that's where social media actually served me because I was, you know, one of the ways I deal with comparison is, is one of my muses is kind of this childlike brat. And she just says, so what? So what? They're better than you. It's, it's kind of almost like an Italian mother. It's like, so what? <laughs> You're oh, wonderful. Sure. Go do it yourself. <laughs> Who cares about what they are doing? And just, just saying, so what? Moving yeah, I, I, I made a video where I showed one of my first sketchbooks and I said, you know, boy, I, you know, look at how far I've come kind of thing. And a lot of people commented and said, well, if I could draw that well now, then I wouldn't have the problem that I have. And I thought, really? Like those, those very first drawings that I did, I look at them and I think, you know, I've come a long way since then, I guess. Um, and other people are saying, well, I can't even get there. So, and, and I think, well, that's just, it's not, I'm sorry that I set that up. I'm sorry that I set that, that comparison up in your mind. You know, if I was saying, well, look, look how far I've come and you, you know, that's not valid to you, then it's not really useful. But my, my feeling was, when I say I'm not, I'm better, when you just said that, you're better, I think it's, again, an unreasonable comparison because you say, now I've been drawing for X number of years and I'm at this level. And at that point I was drawing just for a few weeks and I mm. only got to that level. So in a way I could look at that and say, that was really good. Like you, you, considering that you'd been doing this for X amount of time, I think that was very good. And now you've been doing it for this many years. Maybe you actually, you know what? You're not that good anymore. You're considering how much time you put into it. Maybe you're not that good. So you see, see it's yeah. becomes like a meaningless, complex kind of web of things where you think, well, and again, you could say, like my wife and I were having a conversation yesterday about formula one racers. I don't know if you, there's a show on Netflix about this. And we were th again, a, a, a thing that normally who cares about, but we noticed that most of the people who are Formula One racers come from wealthy families. Hmm. And we were talking about that, saying like, well, you know, they all grew up with this. And you think, well, how could you become a Formula One racer if you didn't come from a wealthy family? I mean, how would you start out? I want to be a racer or I want to drive a million dollar race car. Well, no. So you, you look at it and you think, well, there are advantages that they had. They were in a certain situation. So therefore, there's no point in my even comparing myself with them. And, and you could look again at famous artists or artists who went to art school and you could say, well, they started with this advantage. And so therefore, I can never compete because they're so far ahead of me. You know, like they're doing the equivalent of taking, um, you know, steroids and I could never compete with that. So what? Again, it's yeah. not a competition. It's not, there's no, there's no reason that that's relevant to you. You can... You can look at their art and, and be entertained by it or be illuminated by it. And that's one thing. And you can w work in a different realm completely and still be valid and still feel like you're gaining benefits from it. And it, it, it kind of goes back to, to natural inclination. I do think there is a percentage of people that do have a natural inclination and their drawings when they started out might be better than other people's when they start out. But there's so many stories of people who don't have it that simply with practice, you get it. It's you, you can't not get it. If you're practicing, 
and you're going in the direction of your instinct and style. Like there, there's a lot of art I would like to do, but I know I can't. So I let go of that and really embrace what I can do and enjoy that and be curious about where it can go. I just think the whole drawing world is too exciting not to, to do it. Not um, to be part of it. Yeah. And I think when you look at the things you say you can't do, it may just be that you're not really willing to do them. That's, that's true too. Right. So like I say to myself, like, I can't paint like a fresco on the ceiling. Maybe I could if I was willing to build scaffolding, learn how to use fresco, spend a lot of time doing it, get a stiff neck, take a lot of classes, spend 30 right. years doing it, apprentice to somebody, then maybe I could paint a feeling, uh, do it. But I, I can't be bothered. I'd rather just do a little noodle. So yeah. again, it's, it's, it doesn't really, it's, it's not that you can't, it's that you sh maybe shouldn't or wouldn't or can't be bothered. Well, and so that's fine. You I'm a little uncoordinated. <laughs> I have a fear of heights, actually. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yes, indeed. But so if if somebody is constantly comparing themselves, um, what what do you think is a practical thing to say that would shock them out of it? I think I part of what I'm going to read is, is about that. But I think there's you need to have a little reply or come back ready. And the more that you use it, the more it'll just happen on its own without you having to call it up. But I think, I think um, ones that I've already talked about is, oh, I'm comparing myself, catching yourself and going, this is normal. Um, so what? For me, that combination is, or I'm on my own path. I don't, I don't need to compare myself. I, I'm on my own timeline, my own path. This is nice. Um, or even just stop. <laughs> stop it. Stop. Shut up. Um, Shut up. Because you're selling yourself out. You're you're not on your own side there. It's like, That's true. I'm making this unpleasant. Yeah. That's, it could be that simple. Like, you know what? It's not fun to have that conversation. So mm -hmm. can we not do that? I think another way of looking at it is also to say, you know what? You're very good at making your art. They're good, good at making theirs. You may not be good at making theirs. So what? You, what is authentic to you? What is the thing that is really reflective of your experience, your situation, your perspective on the world that you can make uniquely yours? So then you are making art that only you can make. And then you can judge it by saying, am I, in fact, doing the best job of doing that? You know, am I mm -hmm. really, am I willing to put myself out there? Am I willing to put in the hard work? Um, am I willing to be vulnerable? Am I willing to make sacrifices to get to this? And if I'm not, that isn't to say that I'm bad or that I'll never get there. It's just saying, you know what, I'm, there's, there's only so much I'm willing to invest to get to that thing. So maybe I have a different goal that's more within my reach. So I think, again, it's recognizing the uniqueness of your position. Is That's, that's really what we want from art. We don't want excellence we want truth we want authenticity and the authenticity that you're able to bring is is unique to you so how can you how can you make that happen what can you mm -hmm. do to accomplish that and it may start with quote unquote crappy drawings but then start thinking like why is this crappy is it because i want to do something else what are the things that i have to do to get there or is it that i'm judging it through the wrong lens there's a lot of ways of thinking about it Alternatively, you can also say, you know what, to hell with all of that. I'm just going to do it because it's fun. And if it's mm -hmm. crappy or whatever, then then the, then the lens I'm going to judge it through was, was it fun? Beating myself up took away the fun. So let me do less of that and, yeah. you know, do something else. Right. And I, I think I think it's important to have something that you say to yourself when you catch yourself and say it over and over and over again. So you're retraining your brain to go there on its own because it really is a horrible feeling to compare yourself and feel like you're less than you're, you're just, you're kind of selling yourself out. You know uh, what? It's very high school. She's prettier than I am. He's stronger than, and it's just get over yourself. You're a grown up. Stop it. And be, be you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's um, move on to, um, to talk about, to talk about books, my favorite thing. And we're going to now do our book break. All right, book break. Jill, 
You yes, have some, Danny. It, you, have, you have some printed material to share with us? I do. This is an article that's in the Elephant Journal. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because I've talked about some of it already. But it's Social Media Sting, Five Ways to Move Past Comparing Yourself to Others. And so it goes like this. Back when Thor first drew a bison on the wall of his cave with torch soot, he was pretty impressed with himself. He pointed it to it so Troshi, his woman, would notice and be proud or maybe turned on. He didn't then go to Instagram to upload a snapshot of the sketch, hashtag bison, and while scrolling, noticed that across the savanna, Vilk had drawn a bison and in fact had rendered it larger and better than Thor's, causing him to feel discouraged, envious, and maybe so despondent he didn't notice the saber-toothed tiger ready to devour him. He remained encouraged, and then maybe added a horse. Good Thor I like, say Troshi. The visibility of what people are creating, accomplishing, and happily experiencing is in our face more than it ever has been in any other time. <clears throat> and like many developments of modern society, it has a wickedly double-edged sword. We get to see myriads of art, music, writing, and discover strangers we want to follow because we are inspired, entertained, or have a sense of kindred connection. Sometimes they end up as our friends. The dark side is more common. Comparison can slime us with envy, a feeling of not being good enough, and sometimes depression, all of which can definitely ruin our day, not to mention derail our passion. It has derailed me on several occasions, as well as many people I work with. So I do five, but I'm going to just read two, well, three. Number two is so what? Say so what? It sounds a little bratty, and it is a little bratty, but it can actually be an agent of transcendence. Saying so what? When I see someone I perceive as surpassing me reframes the reaction of, yeah, they've done something I probably can't do yet but I'm not getting my knickers in a twist about it. I'm on my own path. And then I might add, there are many things I've done that I can celebrate. So uh, number, I'm going to do four and five because one of them is kind of funny. Number four is go low. Max Ehrman in Desiderata says, if you compare yourself to others, you may become vain and bitter for always. There will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. The ego is part of us that gets vain and bitter when it sees something it interprets as greater than ourselves. And the ego marinates in irrational lower consciousness thinking. So sometimes, sometimes to satisfy its bottom feeding, I secretly experiment with comparing myself to someone who seems lesser than me, only in that they just started out or that they're a kindergartner. I do this simply to mollify my ego's arrogance. This works in a slightly offhanded, tongue-in-cheek way, but it can be enough to get me out of the evil vortex. And then the last one, this is my favorite, go high, because it mingles with the higher consciousness, which is more satisfying. Instead of separating myself from others by listening to the ego say, look what she did and I didn't, I say, look what we did. The thought, look what we did as women or artists or creative people, unifies us instead of keeps us separate and competitive. Funny thing is, the subconscious doesn't know I'm not talking about me and fills with satisfaction of accomplishment of look what you're doing and motivates me to keep going in my own process. So that is that. Great ideas in there. I like the idea of A beating up children. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but I think also the idea of, um, of, of feeling, I mean, the uh, notion of we, that we, um, look at what artists can do. You know, isn't that yeah. incredible? That's not yeah. taking anything away from you. That's the point. It's not, we're so... Our nature is to be tribal, right? And to say, here's my tribe, there's your tribe. Sometimes my tribe is just me. But, you know, why don't embrace your tribe and to say, and again, it doesn't have to be comparison. It doesn't have to say, like, women make better art than men or French people make better art than Yugoslavians. But I think it should be <laughs> the focus on, you know, something something big that you're a part of and how exciting it is to be a part of it. And if you are too negative and too demeaning to yourself, then you s risk losing membership in that group so you don't you know so like okay. 
Good. right? So yeah. stick with it and uh, and continue to say like, wow, we're doing such cool stuff. You know, this mm -hmm. is really cool. It feels good to say that too. It just feels like it comes from a higher place. Yeah, yeah I think that there's a tendency, you know, to, I mean, I can think about things like you might be an early adopter of something. Like I was the first one to start blogging or podcasting or whatever. And now everybody's doing it. And you could be like, you know, I was the first one there now. But instead you could say, it's so great. Now, now a lot of people are doing this. It's so cool to be part of this large world of doing it. And yes, I was there early, but now everybody's joined the party and it's a much better party for it. So you know, don't be envious. I know it, it when I post something or somebody else would post something and somebody writes, I'm jealous. It It's just not a good, why not? It doesn't feel as good as I'm happy for you. Even if you have to practice it a little bit at first and it mm -hmm. feels awkward and contrived, after a while, you can really adopt. I actually am happy for you. I'm happy for us that we're we're still surviving <laughs> civilization. It reminds me of like, there's a, I have a pet peeve that maybe not reasonable, but I hate when people say, good for you. Mm -hmm. Does that phrase an annoy you? Like, to it, me, it's like, it's not like good it, for it, me, a, meaning like that, like that I got something and that they're like, oh, good for you. You got a brand new car. Good for you. So, well, yeah. It sounds a little sarcastic. <laughs> it does, right? But people say, well, yeah. good for you. Like, you go to, and I think, well, yeah, but like, yeah, that's, again, it's not, it's not a competition. It's not like good for me and, right. not, and bad for you. It's not a zero sum game. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah. All right, I'm going to read something which is adjacent. It's, it is, um, let me explain what it is. So I wrote this little book. It's called The Seven Deadly Sins of Creativity. And it is um, a kind of a, a lengthy essay, I guess. And I wanted to actually, I, ha I haven't, it hasn't been professionally published because I can't be bothered, but it is, um, it is about the different aspects of creativity and the things that get in our way. And they happen to align with the seven deadly sins of um, myth and I guess religion. So I'm going to read from um, the book, and I'm going to read. And if you'd like, by the way, if you'd like a copy of this book, you can get one for free. It, at this, if you just go to seven school, sketchbookschool dot com slash sin, um, sketchbookschool dot com slash sin, and there is a thing where you can sign up and get this book, and I'll send it to you. So this is the chapter on envy. According to Dante's Purgatorio, if you get sent to hell for the sin of envy. Demons will sew your eyelids shut with wire. Ouchie. You get this iron mascara treatment because you spent your days on earth getting a kick out of seeing others in pain. Now you get to look at total blackness and writhe around on a spit. Envy isn't just garden variety green with jealousy. It's meaner. Envy means you don't just resent someone else's good fortune, you want to take it away from them. It's not enough to wish you'd made that great painting. You have to rip it out of the frame and jump up and down on it. In other words, you need to become a critic. Envy is another sin born of fear. It begins when you see someone else making something great. Instead of just enjoying it, you feel threatened by it. The monkey whispers in your ear, you could never do that, ever. So you get out your knives. One response to this fear is to dismiss the accomplishment. The artist was just lucky, or some sort of con man. She was born into a talented family. He sucked up to the top gallery owners. She has a famous boyfriend. He'll be forgotten in a year. When you're envious, you set yourself back. Instead of learning from greatness, you run from it. You swaddle yourself in hostility. You withhold any kind of generosity or support. You refuse to collaborate. You refuse to learn. You don't see how much work it takes to be successful. You don't see how to acquire skills, connections, vision, happiness, all the things you truly want. You're so afraid of losing, of failing, of falling behind, of being called out, that you lash out and destroy. You sew your own eyes shut with wire. And while the biggest victims of envy are the envious themselves, 
they can also cause loads of collateral damage along the way. Maybe you've been a victim of someone else's envy. Try to see the critic for the scared, myopic monster he is, and you'll be able to understand what this critique really means and diffuse its impact. So there you have it. That's a tiny part of the seven deadly sins of creativity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that book. Yeah, I think I think you have some great points there, especially dismissing people. Um, I think that's the the first place we like to go when we're in our lower selves. Is oh yeah, they they have plenty of time, they have the resources, and still it doesn't feel good to to go there that envious place. I think your depiction of it and the collateral damage. Um, it's a really good point, too. Yeah, you always meet these people who, like, kind of know too much about the business, you know? People who, like, know all the gossip and all that stuff. And you think, why don't you go make some art instead of, like, yeah. you know, well, that gallery owner did this and they sold that for this much money and they did... It's like, yeah, yeah, okay, but, like, go make some art. Shut up. So, yeah, yeah I think it's, like, mind you, stick to your knitting, you know, worry about you, do your thing again, you can be a unique contributor. You can make something that nobody else could make. Try and make that. And uh, it's not about other people. And I, I like your the ending, too, in terms of this this monster of the ego and, and trying to be compassionate with it rather than listening to it. It's, it's If you're somebody who does compare yourself and it feels awful, be compassionate with yourself that you have that, that facility. Uh, because that's not fun. And, it, and it's something we sometimes can't control that much. So turning rather just going, oh, I am one of those people that that does this. I came with that with the factory settings. And I need to be compassionate about it for myself. So yeah, I mean, isn't there an expression? I think it's in the AA, which is like, don't judge people's outside from your inside or something like that. I forget how it goes. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, just because you see, just because you're seeing how they are, apparently, doesn't mean you have any insight into how they got to be there, or what that really feels like to be there. So, or what um, they feel about their own work too. They they might be hard on themselves. They may. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of perfectionists out there who are not having a good time. Right. They, they're doing great stuff and not enjoying it. So. Right. Well, good. Well, I think we have. Uh, we have, I'm sure somebody else has done a better discussion of this. I, sure, I'm, oh, I, well, bet there, I bet you there are I know. podcasts out I there that have like done way more insightful things I than know. we have there, about the subject. This is not as good as many of them out there. <laughs> Damn it. You know, I'm sure you've done better, had better conversations than this one that you've had with me. Um, but whatever, this is what we've done. Have, so what? what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, look, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we do as creative people to get in our way. And, you know, ultimately, there are ways to get out to to eliminate them. There are psychological tricks, there are things you can say to yourself. But I think the best thing is to just make stuff, make more stuff, keep making stuff as you do, you will learn stuff, you will go through different ups and downs. But focusing on making is the best solution that at least I've found. I make a lot of crap, um, but I make a lot of stuff. And so out of that crap comes some good things. But I wouldn't have those good things if I hadn't made a lot of crap as well. So that's, that's really my kind of ultimate advice about just about anything, which is, you know, making it is the best revenge. And stop thinking. Stop thinking about yourself. You know, you want to be... Um, conscious but don't be overly self-conscious and that's that's difficult for creative people because you know we're sensitive and we're you know we're vulnerable and we are not necessarily um confident but it's okay put, yeah put your focus on on doing that works for me. and have fun have fun with it i like to share this dr seuss quote you probably heard it today you or you that is truer than true. There is no one who is youer than you. Oh, wise. <laughs>
But there's so many people who've said that. I'm a doctor. <laughs> I know. I could have come up with something better. <laughs> he was, I mean, there's a million people like Dr. Seuss. <laughs> I jest. He is one of a kind. And um, so are you. So, all right, good. Well, thank you, Jill. Thanks so much for doing this this uh, experiment. We've tried lots of different things over this month. We have, we have iterated. We started with an incredibly complicated uh, mm -hmm. agenda and then in front of a live audience and then we simplified it in front of a live audience and then today we gave up the live audience and we just mm -hmm. talked the two of us. So thank you for being willing to do all those things and for doing this with me today. It's been a lot of fun and you are... You are um, a wise woman with lots of insights, and it's I'm, I'm I'm very lucky to be able to take advantage of that. Thank you. Oh, I'm I'm the lucky one. I really appreciate the opportunity, and it has been fun. So thank you. You bet. And as for this podcast, uh, I'm probably going to take a little bit of a break now. I've just taken on too many stupid things, um, <laughs> but I really wanted to jump at this po at this opportunity to do this with Jill for the last month. Um, I have a lot of other people who I probably have on my list to bring onto the podcast, so I will be bringing them on. But I think uh, we'll see. We'll see what I do for the next couple of weeks at mm -hmm. least. So if you have enjoyed this podcast, there are, I think, 80-something episodes of this that hopefully you um, haven't listened to all of them. So go back and listen to them. If you have listened to all of them, they get even better when you listen to them three or four times. So, true. so there's true. probably 320 episodes that you could be listening to or go and listen to other podcasts. Listen to Jill's podcast. Um, Jill, what is the name of, of the podcast that they should be listening to if they're sick of this one? Yeah. Amuses Daydream Amuses is my Daydream. podcast. Yeah. yeah so, so um, but also listen to these podcasts while you're doing something. Hopefully you're drawing, you're painting, you're sculpting, you're cooking, you're dog training, you are, I don't know, doing push-ups, whatever it is, multitask. Yeah, mm -hmm. podcast. Don't don't sit quietly in an armchair listening to this. Um, and if you do, um, hopefully it's going to give you some good ideas. Um, yeah. Art for All is brought to you by Sketchbook School, um, where Art for All is kind of our theme. That's our idea that basically everybody can make art, everybody should make art. And um, it's, it's our right. It is our birthright. So I hope you get to do some. Thanks again. And uh, that's it. Any f parting words, Jill? Just go have fun. Having fun. Go do some art. All right. Yeah. I'm off to have some fun. <laughs>